51%. Out of that, 70% are Christians. Out of that, 17% are Muslims. Out of that, 13% are African traditional religion. These three are the major religions we have in this country. What about the atheists in our group number four? <laughs> well, per our religion, per the way we the African traditional religion, they believe that there's God. They believe that there's God. But they just believe that they cannot worship God directly. They have to go through our ancestors, go through rivers and deities. See, I see, I don't maybe some there are some few people, but they are very, very insignificant in terms of numbers. <laughs> people that don't believe that God exists. They are very, they are very, very uh, small. They, yeah, mostly. And then a few of us that they'll be able to indoctrinate. Yes. Okay. I got a good friend. His name is the God Killer. <laughs> he, kill, he kills your God and let you let you determine your own destiny. Yeah, he's gonna talk to you and then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so ethnically or uh, geographically, Ghana has occupies an area of 92,000 square miles. And about uh, uh, one sixth of that is covered by water, the Volta River. And uh, we are endowed with natural resources. We are endowed with gold. We are endowed with uh, diamond, industrial diamond. We have a gem tie, very small. Oxide, manganese. We are endowed with timber. Our soil is very fertile. We are also now endowed with crude oil. Gold has been mined in this country for over 100 years and is still viable for the next 35 years. But if you, any of you have been to Johannesburg and Ghana or Obuasi, where the gold, the richest gold mine is, the single largest richest gold mine in the world is found here in Ghana. But his name, you know, when the Boers went to Johannesburg, they saw a home. They saw a home. So whatever they used, they dug out from the ghetto for the proceed for the gold was used in developing that home. So Johannesburg is like a, a European Africa. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The British saw Ghana and as exploitative grounds. They came, they took out everything and went away. If you go to Obasi, you'll be so sad that you will cry. If you told you they told you that town has produce gold, the single mine of the richest gold gold mine in the world is this town and gold has been mined here for over 100 years, you will weep. <laughs> it's almost a dead town now, we are trying to revive it. Oh, wow. So, some, that is a mentality of the British. Yep. As we have heard the stories on the slave plantation, the plantation, the British came here with an indirect rule. They used our own people to do the work. The white man seldom come out with a crack and crack the whip. They use a black guy. Mm -hmm. So when you are hitting, you hit your brother. Because you're the one that you are the one cracking the whip, the whip on me, not him. You can disobey his orders, but he can also disobey. If he does, his punishment may be more than yours. So that's how the, they did the idea us, you don't see me there. So they use an indirect rule, they pass through our chiefs and then the rest to rule the country. But there are good things we also did for ourselves. We didn't, we didn't let them take, out, take away our land, even though they try. So when we get, when we get, we talk about land, we'll go into that, into detail about that. So this city called Accra, the national capital, which is the gateway, we call it the gateway to Africa. Has a population of about three million people, but because we build our homes horizontally, when I say horizontally, short homes, bungalows, 
now that we are having apartment buildings that are coming up. So the city centre and some suburbs are now being well, experiencing high-rise areas. Just like the area you are coming, mean, the hotel is, there are high-rise buildings that are coming up in those areas. And the cities have been developed in such a way that every morning you have to move down downtown. We are trying to put up malls and others to ease the traffic that is going downtown. But for now, that's how we move. Some people are moving. Everybody is like a melting point. Everything is melting into it in the morning. And in the evening, it will flow back, leaving the downtown area. The ethnic composition of Ghana is 70 different ethnic groups, 7-0. Ahmed Sisala, he is a, a, an Akan, an Asante. He is a Bimoba, he is that, 70 of us in the country. In terms of languages, we speak more than 46 languages and dialects. But English, is the official language, formal and official language. Aside English, about nine Ghanaian languages are studied up to the PhD level, PhD level. They are spoken on national television and on national radio. So you do not actually need all of these to be able to survive. In Ghana, there's one language or two. If you understand that, if you don't even understand English, you'll be able to move anywhere. The language of the Asante called Twi. You can Twi, you say it's Tree, Tree, T W I. You say Twi, but it's Tree. T W is Tree. Yes, if you understand that, and the Hausa language. Hausa originally are from Niger, southern Niger, northern Nigeria. They moved here because of cross of trade. People trading, they moved there. And also, during the Second World War, there was a conscious effort by the British. They brought in soldiers from southern Nigeria, I mean, uh, Niger, northern Nigeria. They raised an army in Ghana called the West African Frontier Force to fight during the First and Second World War. So Hausa language also, they also they were also good traders. So they traded with the people. So Hausa language is a big, it has a big influence in the people. So if you understand tree and Hausa, you are able to move to any part of this country. And sometimes during transaction, some of the my brothers in Ghana, <coughs> they come. They speak the speech in pidgin English, which is English, cum, some African language. So it's called a pidgin English, and not everybody has a chance to go to school. Therefore, sometimes the English is different. Even those of us who go to school, if you haven't interrupted with American visitors, we, we may even be talking, but. I don't understand what you're talking about. Because, basically, we say, can I get a water? We say, can I get a water? Yes. Water. The spelling is the same, but the pronunciation. So you may be dying of thirst. You are asking me for water, but I don't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> no, it's just you. And also, American English is suggestive it's not instructive enough. I understand we say, can I have a water? It means, give me a bottle. The British say, or the guy who said, give me a bottle of water. It's precise, but you see that as rude. Yeah. But yeah, Americans see that as rude. But with that one, you can't say, I didn't hear you. <laughs> because uh, give me a bottle of water. And can I have a water? But if you say, can I have a water? Yes, you can. No. Well, I mean, you're going to get And I said, no. <laughs> I may say, no, you know, I can't have a water. But I understand. So we try to so the language, the accent sometimes, you will be asking for something that is available. You're seeing it, but the person, it's not his fault. He doesn't understand. What are you talking about? 
So 